have the ID card. So the ceremony transferring uh, the president's casket from the motorcade to the train has now been completed. The military has withdrawn. Reporters on the ground are still in an enforced silence until the train leaves the rail yard here on its journey uh, through several towns from Houston all the way to College Station. A ride, Dominique, I understand, is going to take about two and a half hours. That's what it's looking like. This is engine 4141 that you've been seeing as they pulled back the curtain and revealed the casket, the flag draped casket. As we watched this beautiful ceremony, there were a couple of images that really stood out to me. And as a photographer present, I'm sure these images were captured, but we saw the flag draped casket go by the Bush family in the drizzling rain, and everybody had their hands positioned on their hearts. And then as that casket made its way onto the train there was that last serviceman standing there in salute and it was just a beautiful touching image of honor and grace you saw that the uh, the pallbearers who uh, are trained to do just exactly what we saw uh, who come in from Washington in that baggage car with the president's casket they will uh, ride all the way to its destination so that they can then offload the casket at College Station. And when we saw that funeral hearse arrive and the funeral director opened the back door and released the casket uh, from its moorings, that's the final time a civilian will touch uh, the commander in chief. The military takes over from here. And Bill, you were telling me as we were watching the live pictures of what was happening and you were talking about the Marines role. Can you elaborate on what took place? You saw that it, it was a joint service uh, casket guard, the, the, uh, the men who were, you saw how big they were. Mm -hmm. They all are much bigger than normal servicemen that you will see in the Marine Corps uh, or the Army, the Navy, uh, the Air Force, uh, because they bear a tremendous weight. And it, at some point in some ceremonies that we saw earlier, they lift that casket up to shoulder height so they train for it. They live in a special barracks where the, uh, where the uh, Tomb of the Unknown uh, is in Washington, D.C. They lift weights every day. They, uh, they maintain the strength that's needed to carry out this ceremony. They've come here uh, to carry it out here for Bush 41. They will uh, guard the casket until it arrives and carry it then uh, to its final resting place. And before they lifted and the you casket. Asked me, I'm sorry, you asked me about the Marine. Right. The Marine, uh, the Marine Corps, uh, from a ceremonial aspect, is known for its handling of the American flag. Every Marine is taught uh, the reverence for the flag, all the ceremonial protocol for the flag, and how to fold the flag just a certain way. So before the casket was removed from the hearse, the Marine, who was the the, in, in that uh, casket guard, walked up to the, to the casket, uh, still in the hearse, and inspected the flag to make sure that, it, that in the trip from the church to here, that flag was still exactly as you see it here, the way it's supposed to be. And that has always been the Marine Corps' uh, duty to, to handle and to display the flag of the United States of America. Well, it's a wonderful story to hear and a very important lesson in how we do things, and especially since our Robert Arnold is honoring 
the uh, request of silence there at the train station, it's nice to be able to get your perspective on what was taking place. And as I take a look at our clock, it says 12.57. This train is scheduled to depart at 1 o'clock, and I'm hoping we can put up the train route for you so you'll be able to see where this train will go, but it leaves spring, heads in a northwesterly direction. Huffsmith will be the first stop, and we've got a reporter, Bill Spencer, stationed in Huffsmith. And so we have reporters along this route, and you'll be able to catch a glimpse of what each community is doing to express their thanks and gratitude toward our late president. Uh, Jennifer Reyna was telling me that firefighters are also standing by in these communities, and they will pitch the American flag along the route as well. So it should be a very touching image to see once engine 4141 departs uh, from Westfield train station. In addition, there are three cameras mounted on uh, this train. One that's going to give us a forward view, a bird's eye view of the train, uh, what it sees going forward. One from the back and then one from the side to catch the crowds uh, in these eight little communities uh, between here and College Station. So we'll have that. Uh, that view as well, the, the onboard uh, train cameras, in addition to the cameras that we have stationed along the route and the uh, aerial cameras that we have in our Sky 2 helicopter uh, above the train route. Two hours and 25 minutes, and I'm, I'm looking on a sheet here, and it says food service, lunch. So the uh, President George W. Bush and his family will be dining on the car there as they make their way into College Station. We have our reporter stationed there as well for the ceremony that will take place. Uh, Jonathan Martinez is there, Sophia Beausoleil. As we continue our live pictures for you from the Westfield train station there, you're looking at the casket through a special rail car outfitted in plexiglass on both sides of the train. So no matter where you are along that route, people will be able to see the late president on his way to College Station. The locomotive is the first car, of course. It's 4141, uh, decked out in the colors of Air Force One. And uh, the, the train had been in storage since 2012, awaiting this very day. Uh, the president first laid eyes on it uh, back in 2005. Be, behind that is uh, another Union Pacific engine. The power uh, train is behind that, that drives the train. The crew of the train is in the fourth car. The media is in the fifth. The uh, pool reporters from the network and other places are covering this state funeral. Uh, behind it <coughs> is um, the, the uh, baggage car that we're looking at right now. That's uh, car number six, holds the president's casket. And then the three remaining cars all hold family. Bush 43 is in the car directly behind the baggage here, uh, family and friends uh, th that are going on this route are in those uh, three final cars. Security, of course, very tight along this route. There are specific instructions that, that we uh, have, uh, airspace restrictions, uh, folks on the ground, uh, the silence you see being enforced by Robert Arnold, who is there. So. Uh, all this to say that this is a very secure way to fulfill the president's final wish that he depart from his adopted hometown to his final resting place at his presidential library in College Station, some uh, 95 miles away by car, but only 70 miles by train. It's now a minute after 1 o'clock. The train is scheduled to depart at any moment now from Old Town Spring making its two hour and 25 minute roughly uh, trek up to College Station where another service awaits and a burial which will be private for the family and also not accessible to the media. So as with Barbara Bush's funeral, if you recall viewing that, once the hearse made its way into the gates and the gates closed, uh, that was the end and family was granted privacy to be able to lay their loved one to rest, and, uh, and it's been a difficult year for the Bush family. They lost their matriarch in April, and the patriarch now in December. And, you know, this would have been the first Christmas that President George H.W. Bush would have spent without his wife, Barbara. And they have spent Christmas together, I believe, for the past 71 years, it was said. And it just, 
didn't seem right for him to have to go through a holiday season without his beloved Barbara. And so it's been said over and over that they'll be celebrating Christmas together with Robin. And it just uh, would have been a very difficult time for the president to go through a holiday. As it was, um, Dee, this was the first summer that they had not spent together at Kenny Bunkport, Maine in over 70 years. And they, I, I think they missed, of course they missed the, uh, this, the president missed the, the time that he was um, fighting in uh, the Pacific. Um, but every other summer since then, they have always returned. And, and one of his fondest wishes uh, as um, the train begins to move here, after Barbara died, he said, I want to spend this summer at County Bunkport, mm -hmm. probably realizing that it may be his last summer. And he did that and then returned to Houston, what, in September? Came back to Houston in September. Uh, it was said that he wanted to come back to his Tex-Mex food and his sports teams, which he got to take in. Uh, it was also said that he missed holding his beloved wife's Barbara's hand. And so that longing and that loneliness, I'm sure, was palpable as the children, some of whom live here in Houston, and as those who don't, were in constant contact with their father. The uh, 4141 train now leaving the, the rail yard here. And um, we may mention the fact earlier that you, you know, if you travel from Houston to College Station by car, it takes about an hour if you're in a big hurry, an hour and a half if you're not. Mm -hmm. The train, an hour longer than that, two hours, 25 minutes. Uh, and that speed is enforced by the, by the condition of the track. Uh, we, we, uh, Union Pacific uh, has not uh, replaced or significantly improved uh, train tracks uh, in a very long time, so trains can only travel at a certain speed, probably about 35, 40 miles an hour. And one can imagine that maybe as it goes through those towns where people are standing by, it might slow down a little bit too. You see they have that, uh, what do you call the car with the dome on top, the, the observation deck. Mm -hmm. uh, so they'll be able to, to wave at folks if they want to as they go through the towns here on their way to College Station. It's a beautiful sight this rainy Thursday as the clouds moved in today for the final day of President George H.W. Bush's funeral. Weather has been it's unbelievably been spectacular. good, hasn't it? Yes. The timing just wonderful. Yes, they've been blessed, truly, as we know bad weather is moving into town tomorrow. And our weather team will be talking about that during our newscast later on today. But all in all, it has been uh, with ease and great beauty to be able to celebrate and say goodbye to our 41st president. And in Washington, where the state funeral was held uh, yesterday, they were expecting very bad weather to move in shortly after as well. So uh, on balance, the weather has just been perfect. Many people have commented on the fact that um, the president, had, if he'd planned the weather, <laughs> it would have planned it as such. <laughs> planned it exactly right. this way. I think we're we were seeing the presidential seal on the caboose, the last car of this train, and the last car carrying family. As you mentioned, Bill, the last three cars carrying family, and in advance of that is the casket. So a slow way out of Westfield train station in Spring, Texas and a very special journey. We mentioned that uh, there were four others by train, President Lincoln, President Roosevelt, President Kennedy, and President Eisenhower. You know, not, not all president, a uh, president doesn't have to have a state funeral if he wishes not to. Uh, president Nixon did not have a state funeral, buried in private ceremony in California. Um, and we also mentioned that they plan the funeral while they're in office. They're required to plan it at that time. Uh, there was a department that, that helps them with the, uh, with the wishes, and I'm sure that their final touch is put on later. Uh, but, the, but the bulk of the funeral that we've seen for the past, funeral services that we've seen for the past week were planned uh, back in the late 80s, early 90s. And all of this that we've seen has been essentially 15 years in the making, the execution the, the, the media part of it The has, media yes. part has been 15 years in the making to be able to provide the kind of coverage that allows the access and allows all of us to feel like we're there. I, I think that 
these state funerals are so important for our country, Dominique, because it brings us together and makes us feel that sense of being united Americans. This is, it, it's a very patriotic, moving moment. One of those moments that we all share as, as we say farewell to a former president. And the, the pageantry involved in it all, I think, adds that patriotic, unifying effect. Here's one of the three on camera uh, views that we're going to get that we talked about earlier. It's lovely. You know, and I think to echo what you were just saying, Bill, was the visual from the state funeral in Washington where we saw all of our presidents, all of our living presidents lined up and sitting in the front row of the pew to attend the funeral. And I think that message speaks volumes. It is, you know, the great unifier to be able to bid farewell to an American president, to be able to talk about what leadership means, what service means. And of course, a big part of who George H.W. Bush was, was a friend and family. So it's been mentioned many times before, he was a great man because of what he did, but he was a good man because of who he was. We do have a guest with us today, and we're gonna ask that he uh, come into position here uh, he, he is going to help us with some of the uh, commentary as we move along here. His name is Jim Granado as he, as he joins us here on set. Jim, thank you so much for coming and being a part of this. Jim um, is uh, the executive director of the University of Houston's Hobby School of Public Affairs, professor in the UH Department of Political Science. He has a, a, a large biography here of um, of academia and work in the political field. Thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. Tell us your takeaways from what you've been seeing and also your perspective. Starting on Friday night and talking to people, the, the reminiscences of all people that, that knew him that I know, um, he, he, the heartfelt feeling about his decency as a person, coupled with his monumental achievements. I mean, even though he was a first, you know, one-term president, um, he was quite consequential. Just, just the peaceful end of the Cold War was enough for all of us. I mean, not, not firing a shot. So just even that alone, he was one of the most consequential presidents in our lifetime. Uh, it's been said that he, he lost his second term because of the economy and because of putting the nation first by raising taxes, yes. it, it, he, he almost sealed his own fate, but he realized that was the best thing to do for the country. That's exactly right. I mean, he called it a gut punch when, mm. when Republicans came and said, we can make a deal here. Um, the irony about that deal, even though he did raise tax and violate that pledge, is that there's also a component of deal, dealing with pay as you go, so that if you wanted to increase spending or cut taxes, you had to have a corresponding reduction somewhere else to make sure that the budget deficit didn't grow, which was the whole point of the, of the Budget Act in the first place. Mm -hmm. He also um, uh, was president when the American with Disability Act was yes. ushered in. Yes. And um, we, we were noting that yesterday when we, when we realized that when we saw Bob Dole in a wheelchair stand to salute him, and the president spent his final couple years in a wheelchair and was disabled as well. In the Dole, the, the Dole moment at, at the, in the rotunda. It was in extraordinary. Yes. In 1988, they were at each other's throats. I mean, and there was, there was a, a, an, on a TV show, um, Dole confronted Bush and said, stop lying about my record. I mean, they were not getting along at that point, but as, as you can see, um, they did get along later. In fact, Dole was a, you know, carried a lot of water for him when he was in the Senate. And it, it boils down to what we've been talking about as, as this funeral being a unifier, that it, it's decency and respect yes. in the end. Absolutely. That even though you have differences of opinions, you still must respect the human being. That's a, he's, he sets an example for us. I mean, even in his passing, he's doing one last service for us because in the last four or five days, the, there has, the sniping has been reduced. I mean, not where it has been. We just went through a bruising midterm. And, there's, and after that has been all this, you know, the conflagration we're all going through politically. But there has been a drop in, in our national blood pressure for at least a few days. And what do you think this will do? Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. No, no, no. Okay, but what do you think this is going to do? Uh, do you think this will make people sit back and reflect that, hmm, maybe we need to dial it down a notch? Is there any way to prognosticate here? That's, um, I'm not optimistic. Or I, you, I agree with you. No. I, I think it's probably not going to happen. But boy, at least we had four or five days of relative break. calm. Yes. Of relative calm because mm -hmm. it, it didn't all go away. No. I, I, you may have heard me mention the op-ed in the Chronicle, Houston Chronicle yesterday where uh, they talked about, uh, you know, 
41's not even buried yet, and yet the sniping continues, the temperature is high, yeah. right and left. Right. Um, people talking about the current administration, and this, this opinion uh, editor said, you know, can't we just keep it down until at least we've buried this man? Exactly. But, you know, it, it, it will continue, um, I'm sure, just as soon as this is over, back to the temperature it was before. Correct. I agree. Yeah, uh, sadly. We saw, and I'm not quite sure, as we are on a double box here on the left-hand side, you see a, a camera perspective from engine 4141, and then the other is the aerial shot of the uh, Sky 2 of the train moving through. And I, I saw it pass through. Look at all the cars that have come. You see everybody kind of lined up there. Yeah. And there was one area where I saw a fire truck, and Jennifer Reyna mentioned that the firefighters would have the American flags pitched along the uh, fire trucks there along the route. And it was just a beautiful sight to see. You know, this is this is just the heart of America right here, and the heart of Americans coming out in in the middle of their day. These people could be on lunch break um, or taking time off of work at this point just to pay their respects to the 41st president. And it is that expression of thanks and gratitude that is the the thread of civility in our society, and it's what we enjoy seeing here. That he was huge on civility. That was his main his main uh, goal. For Americans to be more civil with one another, uh, he had, he did not uh, see that come to pass in his lifetime. No, he did not. Fortunately, um, as Dominique was mentioning, you know we're, we're he'll be buried deep in the heart of Texas and right in the middle of this country, and it's it what we're watching here is history. Can you talk a little bit about from the perspective of the history that we're making here today, this week? Well, we're laying to rest a, a president and a man who, when you look at his, the arc of his life, his achievements are just, there's just, there's so many. I mean, he was easily the most qualified president we've ever had. And unfortunately, he did not get reelected. But the point is, he, when he was in office, the things that he did do, we mentioned the, the, um, the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, the, the deft handling of, of, the, of, the, of the Gulf War. I mean, I mean, people who aren't living then can remember what he, we were projecting casualties of, of, of the thousands, and that war was over when the, when the fighting, the ground fight, ground war started, it was over in 100 hours. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, you mentioned the Disabilities Act. There's also, he did some things in, with the Clean Air Act. Um, there was, he started NAFTA, which I guess has a bad name now, but back then that was actually a bipartisan effort. I mean, President Clinton pushed it over the finish line. Mm -hmm. So his achievements are one thing that I think, he, again, he sets an example for all of us. The other thing I would point out is we've talked about his character, and I think you're not hearing people say, even opponents, even his opponents say good things about him. You know, that doesn't happen that often with, with, with politicians. Um, so. I mean, if you were to take a picture of Uncle Sam, maybe we should substitute George Bush's face on that from now on, because he does set an example for us, I think, is just for anybody that gets into public office, you'd like to see people follow. So in terms of the history of, of him and his impact, it's been huge. And in terms of Houston, I mean, you, I don't know if you saw the, the article in the Chronicle by Charles Foster, who was a close mm -hmm. friend of his. He talked about just, it was just a, 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 just a, a tad of what he had done for people, but he had a Rolodex from here to San Francisco, people he knew. Um, and, and that way he could pick up the phone. I mean, just one example, the train that's being used here by Union Pacific, Drew Lewis was the CEO of, of United, mm -hmm. um, Union Pacific. He was a Treasury a Transportation Secretary during the Reagan administration, so they were close friends. Mm -hmm. And that's how this came to pass, that Union Pacific yeah. would dial this up for him. It's fascinating. You know, you talked about some of the legislation that was passed during his time as president, and it was very much, in some cases, a moderate-type agenda. There was a lot of bipartisanship work that took place during that time. Correct. Correct. He, his, actually, Eisenhower had similar problems um, with, with his own party, and, and certainly Bush did too. I mean, there are etches in his diary where he was having trouble with um, Newt Gingrich and some of the members of the Republican, Young Turks at that time. I mean, he was having trouble with his own party. He got along with the speaker at the time, Tom Foley, who was a Democrat. They were fr best friends. Mm -hmm. They had known each other in the House. He did not get along very well with George Mitchell, who was majority leader in the Senate, but he did um, foster friendships. His, for him, the person was political. You could see it. It was just, he was able to just reach out to people and get cooperation. And one of his closest friends towards the end uh, was a Democrat, 
Bill Clinton. Yes. They, mm -hmm. they became famous friends as, as they raised money uh, yeah. for the tsunami uh, and Gulf Coast relief efforts, traveled all over the world together. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know, a lot of people don't realize it, but you know, uh, George H.W. Bush liked a glass of vodka from yes. time to time. I remember one time being at the Houstonian Hotel and uh, uh, talking with him and a, and a, uh, a waiter came by. We were backstage before uh, he, he did his talk and he said, could you bring me a glass of vodka? So the, the young man takes off, he comes back with a cocktail-sized glass with uh, ice and vodka and he says, no son, I said a glass of vodka. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he went back and came back later with a water glass <laughs> full, <laughs> full of vodka. And you know, so he, all this say that he and, the, he and Bill Clinton were, you know, found some common ground in, in the way they like to have fun and commune with one another. Mm -hmm. Called him his brother from another mother. Exactly. Yeah. That's the other thing that when they were doing their their relief work I and mean, they had, they flew plane together, there was only room enough for one bed, and Clinton gave it to Papa Bush. Oh. Yeah. Uh, Jim Granado is joining us. He's the executive director of the University of Houston Hobby School of Public Affairs. Just hold tight with us. I've got some information about uh, this train, specifically the engineer. Her name is June Nobles. She served nine years in the Navy. 16 years with Union Pacific. Hometown is Loris, South Carolina. And the conductor is Randy Kuhanek, served eight years in the Navy, 23 years with Union Pacific from New York. We just saw a, a photograph of um, firefighters standing on top of their truck saluting uh, the train as it goes by. You know, uh, you talked about the, uh, the, uh, the engineer being in the, having been in the Navy of course, Bush 41 was in the Navy, the youngest naval aviator ever, shot down at, at the age of 20 years old. Can you imagine? 20 years old driving a torpedo bomber uh, in World War II over the Pacific, anti-aircraft uh, gun hits his plane. He completes his bombing run in spite of the plane being on fire. And then at the last possible moment, ejects over the, the, uh, the ocean and, and is um, is rescued and then given the distinguished flying cross for his heroism at, all at the age of 20 he comes back to uh, comes back home uh, graduates from Yale gets married gets in the Studebaker and drives to Odessa Texas he and Barbara live in a one-room shotgun it's a double shotgun house they live on one side of it had prostitutes on the other side <laughs> Starting a new and life in Texas. Started, started the, you know, the, their, their oil business career here in Texas, later moved to Houston. And, and talk to us, Jim, about the public service that, that begins from a political standpoint. I mean, he was uh, envoy to China. He was a congressman. He worked, he was head of the CIA at one time. My God, it's so diverse, it's unbelievable. 40 years plus of public service. Oh, yes. His father was a senator, um, and so the first thing he really does, though, is he start, He gets involved in Republican politics in West Texas, moves to Houston, and the Republican Party was was nowhere back then. Mm -hmm. And he's the one that started organizing party apparatus. But then, of course, he runs for the Senate in 1964. He loses to, to Yarborough. He then runs for Congress in 66. He wins, um, and he's reelected in 68. He then runs for the Senate again in 70, and he loses to Lloyd Benson this time. Um, and at that point, Richard Nixon encouraged him to run for the Senate in 1970, brings him on, and he becomes, I believe, chair of the Republican National Committee, which became <laughs> um, an important thing to do because uh, Watergate starts, and he's got to try and keep the party from being destroyed by that, that, that terrible event. And then he um, um, is, is envoy to China, He's, he then becomes CIA director. When Jerry Ford is looking for a running mate, this is not generally known, he picks Nelson Rockefeller, but George Bush was a finalist in that. So he could have been the VP candidate in 1976. And Jerry Ford barely lost Texas. You wonder if he would have won Texas mm -hmm. and won the election, because the election was very close. If Bush would have been his um, running mate, what might have Texas. made a big difference, huh? Exactly. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And then there was the Ross Perot factor. Yes, in 1992. <laughs> you know, yeah, I mean, that's left the dialogue a little bit, but it was a big part of having a third party in there. Right. But yeah, he was VP. He was, after he becomes CIA director, that was, that the agency was in terrible. I mean, you talked to folks that worked at the time, and they said he really was a, unif a unifier again. Mm -hmm. and he was extremely competent. Um, 
and, and help resuscitate the morale of the place. Um, and a, Spent eight years in the, in, the, in the White House as vice president under uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, four years as president, so 12 years uh, in, in the White House altogether. Then his sons, uh, we two governors, and then, <laughs> you know, one of the governors becomes a president. And let's, real quick, as we're looking at these beautiful images, um, just to see these crowds here All by rail crossing, it, it's great. I mean, they're waving American flags. Um, I've seen families holding one another, people just standing by themselves, just waving, waving the American flag, fire trucks with the American flag. I mean, it's just a train route lined with Americans who are proud to wave their American flag. As the train moves uh, westbound out of Houston, but still on city limits, people, uh, you know, who live near these tracks and probably uh, uh, hate it most of the time, but not today. No, they're <laughs> loving it today. What a special and rare opportunity to witness this moment in history, to have this connection, to feel this close, to be feet away from a former president before he is laid to rest in a private ceremony with his family in College Station. It is a unique and rare opportunity, and just as President Bush would have wanted it, just as he wanted it, he created this. This, this picture looked a little bit alarming on the left side of your screen. That train on the left is stationary. It appears to be moving just because we're watching a moving train. People were on the tracks right in front of it, but it's no alarm. So here we, here we are. Uh, what, w will they parallel 290, I guess? All the way? It, it looks like. The, yeah, the, the track is 290 is a, a northwest freeway. So it will parallel, uh, but 290 can and does probably run into other cities than the train will. And so the, the, the train route's been publicized, people knew it, and uh, they've so they've been made preparing their way for to, days. Yeah, to wherever they thought they, they've been staking it out for days now. Mm -hmm. We've been talking to people of the different towns, the officials there, and they were all sort of scratching their heads saying, boy, you know, we're going to have Oof. more people here than we know what to do with. We've, never, we've sure. never had to confront anything like this before. That's right. And, you know, there, there's a lot of ranch land and farmland out there, and so people who are of the land are coming in to these smaller towns to be able to witness this event. And there you can see the traffic on the freeway above. Look at that. I mean, it's just spectacular to see the cars pulled aside and people lining the tracks. You know, that, that's an image from, you know, America of the early 1900s mm -hmm. when people would line train tracks. And it's just not a sight that you see anymore. And this really is a throwback to the days of old. Folks wanted to be a part of history, and history is being made here. I'm going to talk to our producer. Daniel, can you, any idea of the next town that we're approaching? Probably going to go through Hempstead and then on to Huffsmith. The problem in Huffsmith, we have a reporter there, but we haven't been able to tighten up his signal enough to get to him yet. Well, hopefully, that hopefully by the time the train gets there, yeah. that will be uh, resolved. We've got somebody in Navasota as well and in Magnolia. Magnolia. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll um, be visiting with them just as soon as they're, we can get the, the signal uh, to work. A lot of technology involved in covering a, a funeral today, <laughs> as opposed to, but you get so much more. Well, and, and frankly, we were talking about the weather. I'm giving thanks that it's not raining out there today hard because, you know, we are, we have this because of our chopper shot. This is what gives you the perspective. And so we are very grateful that Sky 2 is able to capture this and is not uh, grounded due to weather, which, you know, will happen tomorrow. And the side mount camera on board the train right. itself that's showing us the left part of the screen here folks standing uh, on the uh, on the tracks that go the other direction waving at the train as it goes by it's a beautiful sight and our chopper to the right and the train as you said the first uh, town will be Huffsmith but still there are many many areas where we're seeing crowds gather not it doesn't have to be these uh, Texas towns it's just anywhere along the route and anywhere close to where these folks live and a lot of people driving in from the cities and they're just finding a space because they know some of these towns will be heavily populated because of this special and, and remarkable event. And that's true, people. We, we did a story on one person who uh, traveled a thousand miles uh, to be part of history, to see uh, this happen. Uh, we had that nice email yesterday from a former congressman mm -hmm. uh, from Ohio who uh, has moved to Texas and came here because he was invited uh, to the funeral. He, he had, he had uh, uh, served during the same time that uh, 41 was in the White House and knew the president and 
he, uh, he and his wife got an invitation and came here to Houston to, uh, to attend it. All kinds of notables, dignitaries, famous people. We had uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger talking. Uh, it was really spectacular to see the turnout at St. Martin's Church today and, and just a beautiful service, um, quite uplifting, quite a celebration of his life. His grandson, the eldest grandson, George P. Bush, talked about his favorite food, barbecue, tacos, <laughs> ice cream. I found out that Chinese he liked food. Klondike bars. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's great, these anecdotal stories. And then there was that really sweet story of how, how 41 would say, uh, the kids would get a first to sleep award, which is genius. When you have that many grandkids and you need quiet in the house, you set up some sort of a system and a, and a game to get everybody into bed. But it was wonderful, this, this insight into the personal family life. And as we've been talking to Jim Granado, who's with the U of H Hobby School of Public Affairs, we've been talking about his public service, but equally as important is his private service. Sure. I just got an email from somebody who's who's watching the uh, the train go by. Uh, it said they're currently parallel to 99 near Gosling Road, so fo folks are 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 um, watching uh, the coverage, I guess, on their cell phones and listening to us talk and letting us know uh, where they are along the route here. The, again, technology, right? Gotcha. It's crazy. Real time. Yeah, in, in real time. Look, look at the, the crowd here on the right side yeah. of your screen. Who are wait, who, I don't think the train's come through just yet. No, that's but there's the another chopper, fire that's truck. That's our helicopter mm -hmm. shot. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, so there are fire trucks that are, that are stationed all along. This, this has to be sort of a nightmare for the Secret Service because they like to secure routes in advance, but when you, you know, you're trying to secure a 70-mile stretch of country. Sure, when anybody could pop along a rail, a rail track, and that's what's happening. People are just finding their opportunity to get in and pay their respects. And we've seen clusters of Texans and clusters of American flags. So it's a beautiful tribute and, and send off to a president who made it known that he was a president of the people, that he connected with the people. We've been talking this past week about how many people have a photograph with the 41st president. He was that accessible and that approachable. He was always out and about whenever he was here in Houston. We talked about how he ate at his favorite restaurants, attended his favorite sporting games. He was never secluded in any way, always real and approachable, let everybody take a picture with him, made everyone feel special in the process. And so it makes sense that we see this type of public outpouring of love and affection for a man who turned nobody down. And, you know, most people who came into contact with this president, even in a very peripheral way, uh, say at a, uh, working at a restaurant, not necessarily uh, a significant meeting, got a note from the president. Mm -hmm. uh, I suspect that he probably had somebody on his staff who, who, who uh, wrote most, most of these notes at, at his That he direction. probably dictated. That, and, and then that he signed mm -hmm. and sent. But mm -hmm. what, 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 do, what do you think that's about, Jim uh, Granado, about all these notes and all these photographs? He's building a legacy in, in, a, in a way, is he not? Friendship mattered to him, obviously, and he just, he, he just liked people, which made him a very important public figure. I mean, you have to like people, be successful, and he just, he just built these relationships. And what you're seeing here and uh, today, but in the last four or five days, it can't be faked. We liked this man, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's in that example you just brought up about the notes. That's just one thing, but he was he was forever helping people. From what, I mean, I have colleagues at, at the Bush School, at Texas A&M, and they, they talk about when people would come into their apartment for a party, the Bushes would serve them, serve them the drinks. Yeah. I mean, it's just, just that kind of, you know, servant leadership is and just... Having come from such a patrician background yes. to... to to, to the life of humility and service that they had. I, I read that uh, in the inauguration, Barbara wore shoes that she bought for $26. <laughs> I bet they were comfortable. And, you know, I mean, they just weren't pretentious people. That's right. You know, they... Uh, she made a joke during when she, they were first elected, you'll be seeing pearls. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Fake, I mean, they were like, they were Fake not books. expensive. Yeah. No, right. not at all. Right, exactly. And, and that's what made her so endearing yeah. because she was touchable, relatable, and people could be like her. Yeah. Yeah. People could be like her. She always said she didn't like her neck, and that's why she wore her pearls. But it became such a beautiful statement and a symbol of her class and elegance. 
and, uh, and even more so was just witnessing this phenomenal love affair between yes. two people. You know, a couple married for as long as they were is a rarity these days. And then to see the level of love, admiration, and respect that they had for one another also set that bar even higher. Dominique, we're going to visit with uh, Brittany Jeffers, who is in one of the towns along the train route here. She's in Magnolia. Of course, the train's not there yet, but people are. Brittany, what are you, what are you seeing there? Yeah, Bill, people have been here since before dawn this morning. I heard somebody describe this as the heart of the city. Uh, they're here near the historic depot on both sides of the tracks. If you take a look, they've got their lawn chairs, their flags, their umbrellas because it was drizzly this morning. So many of them saying that they wanted to be here to experience history, to have the opportunity to pay their respects to the 41st president. Talked with people from all over, people who've traveled here from New Caney, from Beaumont, from College Station, uh, someone from Georgia even who said that he took his kids out of school for a few days so that they could make a road trip just to be here. Um, also, people who are local. I'm here with a veteran right now, uh, Mr. Jim Carroll, is it? Uh, sir, why did you want to be here uh, today? Well, President Bush was a veteran. I'm a veteran, and I just had to show my respect for him. As, as a veteran and as our president. And thank you for your service as well, sir. Um, uh, we were here early this morning. Uh, other people were here even before us, before the sun came up. What did you think of this, uh, to be here in your town, to see so many people here who want uh, to, to give a tribute? This is remarkable. I didn't know that there was that many people in Magnolia. <laughs> <laughs> there is literally thousands of people here. And, and I thank them, each and every one of them, for being here. Uh, for those, uh, I, w I was trying to explain, uh, you, do, you can see up and down the tracks here, the, the flags and, and people sitting and just the camaraderie, uh, it, kind of a unified front here. How would you describe all of the, the people and, and sort of the feeling here right now? It's, it's a feeling of u unity. Uh, something that uh, President Bush pushed for, being friendly, being uh, uh, being one, being a country, and being together. Love it. You said that very well, sir. Thank you again. I Thank so you. appreciate it. Uh, again, people are here just waiting anxiously for 4141 to arrive. Uh, we are going to be waiting uh, as well. Montgomery Police Department has, was out here pushing people back uh, and reminding them the safety measures as staying about 25 feet from the tracks as we wait. So we will be out here. We'll keep checking in with you. The train anticipated to be here shortly. And we will, we will rejoin you when it comes through. And just for your information, it's just about to Huffsmith. So that's about two towns away from you. So we'll get back with you, Brittany Jeffers. One thing that really warms my heart is that the world gets to see yet again how spectacular Texans are. And just this, we've been talking about how this event and this moment is a unifier and how everybody has come out to celebrate this great man and to be a part of this movement in this moment and it's something similar that happened after Hurricane Harvey right. and the world got to see another unifier right. and the way that we all come together no matter what our thoughts and beliefs are just got an email from a woman Dominique named Connie Wong uh, she put in the title bar America loves Bush Bush loved America Americans are showing this today on the past week so proud of us yes exactly means, everyone you know, all Americans thank you Connie Wong uh, it, it, that's the feeling I think that people have. One of pride, patriotism, mm -hmm. sense of being together. That's, that's what, you know, this sort of spectacle uh, brings out in us. That we're together, we're Americans, we're proud of one another, we're, we're together. And there they are, together. Americans, Texans, the American flag, people waiting feeling happy to be a part of something that is sad to lose a president, to lose a great man, to lose the matriarch and patriarch of a family that we've called our own is not easy. But yet we celebrate him today. We celebrate them this year of 2018 where we've lost both Bushes. We're grateful for them. We're grateful for their service, their 
commitment to our country, to our community, to each other. And that's what you're seeing today is just an outpouring of love and appreciation. Got another email here from a fellow uh, who's the GM, a general manager of sales operations um, for some company here who says, complimentarily that you're doing an incredible job with the coverage. I think what he really, what he's really saying here is he's glad to be a part of it to watch online or on television this very histor historic moment because without this, uh, without the, the, the window on the world that television gives you, you can't be a part of it. And it's 15 years in the making as we've said, the media planning and preparation for an event like this is, it's an astronomical amount of work, time, and effort to set up and to make sure everything is in place. And, uh, and, I've, and I think that the planning and execution have been superb, don't superb, you? Superb, superb. And the weather has cooperated and everything has just gone without a hitch, on time and respectful. So um, Jim Granato, uh, Bush 41, leaves the White House in the early 1990s. What happens after that? He licks his wounds for a while. I mean, he was... He was, he was hurt, um, but he came back to Houston and he just poured himself into the community, did many things. A lot of people thought he would not come back here. Thought we'd seen the end, uh, the last of them when he left the White House, that he'd go back to, to the East Coast, to Maine. But he came back. He sticks, right? He, he sticks. sticks with his friends. Opened an office over on uh, Woodway. Um, yes. Uh, and had his staff and went to work doing what? He was involved in numerous, I mean, Charles Foster recounted some of those things. It was, he was a, the ambassador for the city in some sense because he knew, I mean, world leaders would want to come to Houston just to visit with, with President Bush. He helped the city grow in significant oh, yes. ways. Yes, yes. Uh, so he was kind of like, I guess, is a one-man chamber of commerce for the city, I guess you could say, because of his, his name recognition. And, and again, the fact that he was, he was the most powerful leader in the world, but he had been involved in the public arena, not only nationally, but internationally, for decades. So he had all kinds of friends who I'm sure he wrote notes to and, mm -hmm. and things of that sort. He was, you know, had personal touch. They, there was a bond between him and, I mean, the list must be un, just uncountable of people that he knew um, and interacted with. And the level of fundraising, too. I mean, you mentioned all the friendships that he made, and those friends would press in and rely on him for help to serve as you know honorary chair or in some role uh, fundraiser to help with their particular charities and organizations. He became entrenched in this community in that way, both he and Barbara. And of course, he was the biggest champion and supporter of her literacy campaign Correct. and would focus on his points of light. And you know, they would, they would continue their message in a private way. Right. And another investment in the state was building the Bush School at a and I mean, mm -hmm. he didn't have to do it here. In the state, he could have gone. You know, typically you go to your alma mater. He's a he's a Yaley, so he could have talked. You know, done something in the Yale, in, you know, in Yale, for for example. And he chose to. He to he, he wanted to be involved in high speed rail in Texas yeah, too. Right. I mean, you know, he yeah. he he he, uh, he told them, "Let me know how this progresses. I want to be a part of this. I now want to be on the first train." And then somebody said, "You know, this isn't going to happen until 23 or something <laughs> like that." Um, or 29, whatever, whatever that date was, and, and, you, and, and he said, what's your point? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so they're rolling into Huffsmith now, and we have a reporter there, but uh, unfortunately, we can't get a signal from, from that unit yet, so. Uh, but you know, when I came to Houston 45 years ago, you could still see the Esperson building. We didn't have a skyline. Mm -hmm. Uh, you saw the, the, the Esperson building, the Hyatt Hotel, which was new, with, with its revolving restaurant on top. The, um, the uh, it wasn't the Exxon building, uh, what, what they, the Esso building or whatever it was. I mean, we really had no skyline. To say that George Bush <coughs> was so instrumental in helping this town grow to, to the skyline we have here in business and banking and real estate and, and just everything, because he was so well connected and so many people here could turn to him for, for his connections to help build this city to, to what it's become. He was involved in sports and, and commerce and just, he's, people, I don't think people realize he what a driving force. He had his hand in every pot. Yeah, a driving force he was here. Look to at, have a president live, a former president live in your city is a huge asset. Look at this photo, by the way, from Jeb Jr. This is from inside the train, mm -hmm. Barbara and Jenna. 
waving folks to the waving, crowd. Yeah. His granddaughter's right there. They're in that uh, in the observation deck car there. Hmm. I mean, your point about the president, um, the thing I, when you say that about his engagement, I mean, he didn't cord himself off, right? He, he, was, in, he was in our face every day, basically, and that mm. was, was a great thing for all of us. I, I, I was trying to read. I have my glasses on, so I think I, I did better than mo normal, but I think it said we're, we're almost, we're trying to get there, Gampy. So they're talking about, and they all called him Gampy, which was such an endearing name for him. But they're talking about how close he is now to his beloved bar and Robin and final resting place. You know, this nickname thing in the Bush clan was really quite something. And um, his Almost best Organi friend is what here, it says. His best friend, um, mm. Jim Baker, uh, Secretary Baker, uh, called him Jefe, the Spanish word for chief or boss. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, uh, you, you know, they, they, just, they, they just had this penchant for familiarity that's really kind of endearing because it's part of what we all do. Look at this. And there goes the Hefe through Huffsmith. And the crowd waving and cheering. It's a beautiful sight. And you know, and as you look at the image on the left-hand side, look, I mean, there are no roads there. It, it looks like just forest, but yet sprinkled about are people. How did they get there? What, where's the nearest road? How long did it take to find that place? Some of them are just there independently, like little pepper sprinkles. I mean, it's really something to see. This is a two hour, 25 minute journey uh, from Houston to College Station. Uh, eight different towns uh, along the route here. And as we've uh, been showing you from the onboard camera, each time it goes through a, a, a an area that has uh, these small towns, all the population standing out there waving at the train. Look, look, look we just at that. passed, yeah. It, it's just amazing. It's so standing people very parking. close to, the, tra right. to the train tracks there. It's unbelievable. Remember yeah. the old, remember the old pennies on the track that children oh, yeah. used to do? I, I'm sure somebody's <laughs> done it in every one of these towns. It put a, uh, a couple of pennies 50 on the cent track. piece or, or a quarter. Flatten it out. Goes over it. Yep. You, you've got quite a little souvenir. That's right. And a good luck. I'm sure a lot of people have done that. I was mm -hmm. thinking about that yesterday, Dee. That's, uh, that people, people will be doing will pennies do on the track. Yep. Now that we still have pennies. No, they're probably using something <laughs> bigger now. <laughs> Amazing, just amazing. So we've gone through Huffsmith. Uh, I think Pinehurst is next up on the list. I'm waiting to get confirmation as to where it is. But it's just a beautiful ride, and it's, it's going to be a similar image that you'll see up and down this route from Spring up to College Station. Some larger towns with greater numbers of people, larger American flags, fire trucks, and then just a few people here and there randomly along the track at some little place probably next to a farm road. There, look, with a tent. I mean, it, th that to me just speaks yeah, volumes. Yeah, camped out to see the, the, the few seconds of this train passing by. As we mentioned That's earlier, right. this is actually the second trip that the Bush clan has made by train from Houston to, um, to College Station. The first time was, uh, I think it was in 1994 when they were gonna break ground on the Bush Library in College Station. Uh, the Bushes had a bunch of people fly into town um, family, friends, dignitaries from Washington who all wanted to attend it, and they were, they were trying to puzzle out how they were going to get, do we run a bus? Do we, how are we going to get everybody from, <laughs> from Houston to, um, to College Station? So, um, you know, as you were saying, Jim, they called, they called uh, Union Pacific and, and said, uh, could we have a train to get people from here to there? And they here came through, so everybody jumped on a train. Uh, and, and rode from Houston to uh, College Station uh, and back uh, for the groundbreaking of the Bush Presidential Library. So this is actually the second trip by train. Almost so, in Pinehurst, I'm understanding. So that must be the shot of Pinehurst where you can see more people lining the rail track, and that, more cars. And so that would the put them stop. Uh, maybe 10 minutes from Magnolia, where mm -hmm. we have a reporter Brittany there. Jeffers is. So we'll right. be going back to her to to actually witness what it's like when the train goes through a town there, see all the folks lining the Yeah, road I'm excited to see that, to feel that, because I'm sure that energy and emotion is palpable when that train passes through. But nearing Pinehurst, 
So you're looking on the left-hand side, a camera on the train. So you get the vantage point of the train passing people by. Soon we'll see those people through that from That's the camera. That's right. Yeah. But I've, I've loved seeing just the little sprinkling of people just in these little small towns in between the bigger small towns as this train makes its way to College Station. It's, uh, it's really quite spectacular. During your time uh, at the uh, University of Houston, University of Texas, did you ever um, see 41 come to the schools, either one, to talk to? I never met him. Um, I did see him speak in 1980. Uh-huh. And where was that? At, in Carbondale, Illinois. I went to Southern Illinois. And this is when the Illinois primary was going on. Mm -hmm. and, this, and he uttered the phrase voodoo economics. Oh, that's right. He was, he was taking on Ronald Reagan at the time. But that was the first time I saw him in person. Um, but uh, they, there's several friends that I have that know him, uh, as you'd expect. And they, uh -huh. it, it's just, I mean, the, the emails and the phone calls I've been getting from people about him have just been spectacular. And what's some of the dialogue that takes place in the school? If you're just joining us, you're listening to Jim Granado, who's the executive director of U of H's Hobby School of Public Affairs. Just curious, what are some of the lessons that are taught at the school? The school emphasizes data analysis and ethics mm -hmm. um, so that you, you're, you learn, you're trained to work with data, but you also don't separate values. I mean, kind of like President Bush, right? He, values were never separate from his achievements. So we put a, a very strong premium on, on values in terms of the debate between equality and, and liberty, for example, or, or how you collect the data, how there are ethical practices you must follow. So our students come out of there with, those are two prongs, are you you're strong in data and, and ethics. Here's the train coming through Pinehurst now, and you see the side camera and the, uh, the, the, the aerial from our helicopter. Beautiful. The uh, chopper is now honing in on the car, carrying 41's casket. Plexiglass on both sides, so no matter where people are standing along the track, they'll be able to get the vantage point. See the casket as it comes through That's the That's right. Yeah. And uh, it being guarded by a service member. The family in the three cars behind. And we saw that beautiful tweet of the Bush granddaughters, Jenna and Barbara, waving to the crowd inside. When they all arrived uh, back in Houston yesterday, they, uh, they uh, did a, a, f a flyover in College Station. And we got a tweet photograph over the left wing of the Bush School and, um, and the Bush Library uh, that somebody uh, snapped from Air Force One. So now they go back on a train. This is Pinehurst, and the next uh, next, next stop one will be Magnolia. Not, I shouldn't say stop. Next mm. pass through is Magnolia. Right, Brittany Jeffers is there, so we'll be able to get some reaction for you from the ground. You know, th th this this ride that we're witnessing had to have gone through the president's mind many times, projecting himself along this route. Uh, he had faced his own mortality for several for the last four, three or four years. Uh, he had some very, very close calls um, where he spent time in, in the medical center here at Methodist. This time when he got sick, we got, the, we got the, the word before he died that he would not be going back to the hospital, which told us... The end was, was near. Yes. And they would not try to prolong life anymore. But from the way it's been described by Jim Baker, one of his closest friends and former Secretary of State, that it was a, a beautiful passing. It was an easy passing. Uh, he so in keeping with his personality. It was so in line. In so it, just with ease, with ease and relationship, just surrounded by family and friends. And, you know, I think we all broke down when watching the state funeral yeah. and learning about Jim Baker rubbing the feet of the former president. What a gift and what an honor to do that to somebody. And I just was so touched as everybody else in hearing these stories, hearing about uh, the former president George W. Bush, that final phone call to his father, right. telling him what a great dad, and that final I love you too from 41. His final words, his final I words. had the word love. Yep. Yeah. It was just, it was beautiful all around. You know, I, I feel that we are all so fortunate to have witnessed a beautiful life lived and the passing of that life in the same beauty and here, as we look at a, a train that is reminiscent of 
America's yesteryear, we see it carrying our 41st president to his final resting place and where the family can truly say goodbye in privacy. The cameras will not be there anymore. The media will not be there. It's their moment. It's their moment to let go. But what an honor for all of us to be a part of this moment and the way it was so carefully and beautifully orchestrated. So now we have four uh, living presidents, correct? Uh, we had five uh, with the passing of 41, at least four. All of them have already planned their funerals. Uh, and, and Donald Trump is planning his uh, right now while he's in office, since they have to do it then. So when they, when they got together for this state funeral, thoughts of their own mortality and their own plans had to have gone through their minds as well as we mentioned that that he must have that uh, 41 must have thought about this train ride and, and i'm sure it's every bit as magnificent as he had envisioned it in his mind's eye and we'll probably be seeing more images uh, from inside that train and the grandchildren who are very present on social media and have also been looping us all in in the experience and the moment through their tweets and posts and Instagram images and, and all of that. And you know, that's the power of social media connecting. And so to be able to see an image like that of the two girls um, Look, that seeing their backs. Look, that seems to be some sort of formation. Are those yes. firefighters perhaps? Air Force? I, I see, yeah. Uh, they, they may have a military reserve unit standing there. Yeah, let's go to Brittany Jeffers in Magnolia. The train will be getting closer to her. Brittany, what are you seeing there? Well, right now we're seeing uh, a lot of emotions from the crowd out here. People clutching their phones, grabbing the flags. Uh, very excited out here, a lot of nostalgia. Also, so many people anxious, they say, to witness history. Uh, we want you to take a look just how many people are out here. Uh, many of them have been here since before dawn, here in their lawn chairs with their flags, all awaiting the 4141 to arrive. And from my vantage point right now, I can see the light on the front of the train. I want you to look around at the crowd out here right now. Many people waving their flags as they wait for this moment. We spoke with a lot of people from all over. They traveled from Beaumont, from New Caney, from College Station, some people from Georgia, some from Tennessee, all said that they wanted to be here for this very rare uh, and historic moment, that they wanted to share this with their family. Uh, they've been out here, some of them, for hours uh, in the small town of Magnolia, anxiously awaiting their chance to see 4141 pass through and the opportunity to pay their respects to the president. also get a sense of um, the security and safety out here as well. We have seen constables as well as the Magnolia Police Department out here checking in with people, wanting them to be able to pay their respects, but to be able to do so in a very safe way, reminding people to stay 25 feet away from the tracks out here. Uh, the crowd, I would say, has excuse me, the crowd out here has continued to grow. Uh, I would say within the past 30 minutes or so, we've seen even more people arrive out here. Many of them, as I mentioned, from surrounding cities waiting for their opportunity to see the 4141 pass through uh, as part of its 75-mile uh, journey on the way to College Station.
We can hear people out here murmuring, here she comes, here comes the train. Many people getting their phones out to snap a photo. Other people with their hand over their hearts, others clutching the flag. A truly historic and rare moment. We've got so many people out here uh, who, uh, someone just said that this was amazing. Um, would history you, in the making. History <laughs> in the making, you say? Yes. Ma'am, what is your name? Judy Brennan. Judy Brennan. And where did you, where did you come in from? Spring. From Spring. Yeah. Ma'am, please explain what this was like. I, I really don't know what words to say. It's just heartfelt. He's a great man. You have tears in your eyes. I know. I, it, was well, truly, it was truly special. Right, yeah. My husband met him, and he said it was like he knew him forever. He just was so pleasant and acted like he knew my husband forever when he shook his hand. A truly rare and, right. and special moment to be here uh, with a large crowd of people. What was that like to be shoulder to shoulder with your community out here? I, it seemed like there was a lot of com camaraderie going on, which, you know, we haven't seen much of lately in this country so i'm glad to see it everybody's out well, every different walks of life are here to say goodbye to him he's a great man yes yes thank you very true yes and you you saw it for yourself so many people clutching the flag out here today um taking a moment uh to stay here to pay their respects to the 41st president uh, we saw toddlers here we saw veterans here so many people still taking some time uh, to gather their emotions Many people around me looking at their phones uh, as well as some of the pictures and the moments that they collected out here. Truly, um, truly a special and, as I mentioned, rare moment to get to be out here to witness this here in Magnolia today. Bill and Dominique. You, you, you witness history for sure, and he uh, today is the great unifier. And, you know, we're all sort of coming through our social media and and people are reaching out to us and everybody is sharing their connection to the former president and I just got a uh, Facebook message from Phyllis Santello Christensen and she said can you mention that one of their favorite Tex-Mex restaurants was El Tiempo Cantinas they went there a lot during their good years here and also they love musicals they both attended Jersey Boys at the Hobby Center uh, it was the last show that they saw, and uh, Phyllis says she was sitting right below them. They just love music. Right. They like Molina's restaurant as well. There were a number of places that people saw them around town. Yeah. I'd mentioned earlier that uh, part of the reason that trains go slowly in Texas is because of the condition of the tracks, and that uh, comment was informed by the fact that I've taken trains here in Texas. I've ridden the train from Houston to Los Angeles, uh, from Houston to Chicago. And at that time, admittedly, this was some years ago, the trains went very, very slowly because of the condition of the tracks. Union Pacific begs to disagree. They are not happy about that comment. They say they have now spent $450 million in Texas on railroad improvements. They don't specifically mention the track, but I imagine it, it, it uh, includes the track. Um, they asked for a clarification, and there it is. Apologies to Union Pacific. Glad they made improvements on the track. 
And it's been a beautiful route so far. We just saw Brittany Jeffers in Magnolia, so Todd Mission is next and uh, and the footage also confirmed that as the train makes its way through these towns it's slowing down to give the people who have collected a chance to see instead of it just whisking on through which is so very nice um, so everybody is taking their photos they're posting it i can imagine this is going to be a big social media opportunity for so many people who are there everybody's excited to share that they are witnessing history and are able to feel like they can reach out and practically touch the president as he goes by on train and wave their American flag. There must be a run on small American flags today at a lot of uh, little family stores through these towns. But such a patriotic sight. What an image. What an image to be able to capture. A train carrying a president with Americans standing by with their flags and honoring and saluting him. It's really beautiful. The next town... Uh Todd Mission. I don't think we have anybody there, but we will see um, the train pass through. And because of the camera we're looking at right now, we'll see the crowds as, as well. Right. It's in Grimes County, small town. They said the 2010 census had population of 107. So five towns left before uh, they get to College Station. The um, Stoneham. Right. Never heard of the name of that town. Then Navasota, Milliken, and Welburn before finally arriving in College, College Station. Station. Right. I wish we had marked with the time that they left uh, the rail yard. It was uh, around 104, 105. You're right, it that's was just exactly a few what minutes it was. After So one. Uh, they've been on about an hour now. Right. So and about an hour and 25 minutes remaining. Yes, because they were estimating a two hour, 25 minute ride, uh, which factors in the slowing down through these different towns that they're going through. So 225, and that, let's see if they left around 1, 2, so around 3.30-ish is when they're going to arrive in College Station. So a little bit more, about an hour and a half left. But we've got uh, a small train, Union Pacific. The casket is in the center of the train. Media is in front. Family, the three uh, last cars contain the family. And it's been so nice to see the pictures that have come from uh, the family as they spend their last couple of hours with their father, their Gampy, as the grandchildren called him. You can only imagine the stories that are being shared inside those last three cars. You can only imagine how exhausted the Bush family must be. Their father, grandfather, passed away Friday night and it has been a whirlwind for this family. They just flew in from Washington, D.C. yesterday. We covered that aspect for you when they arrived at Ellington Field and then bringing the casket over to St. Martin's Church. And then early this morning, everyone was up for the funeral. About 1,000 people in attendance on the guest list. You saw many people, many notable figures from Houston, but also outside of Houston, former politicians, Hollywood folks. Um, everybody here in attendance and now this last leg of the journey to burial this last leg that was designed by the former president all-inclusive of everybody along this route to be able to be a part of it because you, you know they couldn't attend the state funeral in Washington and it was a limited viewing here for the funeral in Houston by invitation only so this is really the all-inclusive part where everybody gets to reach out and say goodbye and it's a beautiful journey to be able to show. It truly is. The uh, Texas countryside lovely on this overcast day. The rain is held back for the mm -hmm. most part. Tomorrow, different story. You try to go through this area tomorrow uh, around between noon and 6 o'clock, 6 o'clock to 5 o'clock in the morning as that front moves through. Oof. Yeah. Well, very fortunate. I mean, very blessed. Frank even said we might, you know, see tornadic activity along this. Uh, yeah this frontal line. So today we will gladly accept the occasional sprinkle on the windshield. You and see how the train uh, <laughs> appears to be moving in the opposite direction because the, the, uh, the choppers move to the other side. Sure. Yeah, it's, it's a, <laughs> quite the illusion. Yeah. But what you see on the left is the camera from uh, engine 4141. On the right is Sky 2's vantage point. And it looks like, I, I can't quite tell, was that Todd Mission that they went through or are they nearing it? I'm going to get confirmation. Yeah, Todd Mission is a very small town, so it looks like that was Todd Mission. And if that's the case, uh, Stoneham 
is next up on the list that everybody's taking in now, the Texas landscape. Um, just before we go um, ahead of the train here, I, I got another email about the Union Pacific rail conditions. Uh, I live on this line and can attest to the fact that they are in the middle of major improvements to this line. So there are improvements being made to the, to the rail lines, making it possible for trains to go faster. Uh, and, you know, one day uh, we may have high, real high-speed high speed rail. rail. Sure. It's been a huge talk uh, and it's Texas. been the source of contentious debate of uh, setting up rail to bridge the gap between the cities. Mainly from people who live in, in the kind of bucolic setting that you see right here because right. they don't want uh, an electric train uh, racing through their, sure. their countryside and, there. And we've heard numerous stories about eminent domain and all that that entails. And so it's, it's a very tangled web. But, uh, you know, whether you're for it or against it, it's, it's certainly been hotly debated here in the state of Texas, being able to connect our large cities by rail. And uh, time will tell. So we, we see some uh, fire apparatus here through this area that they're moving through. We're going to go up the line here to Navasota, where uh, Mario Diaz uh, who had been in by. College Station for the past couple of days uh, reporting on preparations there for the arrival. He's uh, joining us uh, in Navasota. Mario. Bill, Dominique, uh, we are here in Navasota. The rain has come down here in the last uh, 30 minutes, a bit stronger than it was much earlier this morning, but that is not dampening the spirits of the crowd here. Let me just step away and just show you how many people have gathered here in Navasota. We are in the heart of downtown here off of Washington, and you can see that there are thousands that have come out in support of President Bush as he heads up to his final resting home in College Station. You have a sign at one of the buildings here, just to the camera there right across the way there to my left, it says, President George H.W. Bush, thank you for a lifetime of service. As we pan over to some of the other buildings over here, we also have people that are up in the windows, young children that are ho holding up American flags, and you also have a flag of the state of Texas high overhead. I'm going to step over here, and I'm going to speak with a couple of people who have been here since about 10 o'clock this morning. This is this is Darlene out of West Columbia. This is Karen, who's from Britain. I'm going to start with you. Um, you drove all the way up here this morning. Yes. Why? To honor President Bush. We felt that it was necessary. He was such a wonderful man. He's leaving such a legacy, and he's from the old school of respect and yeah. faith first and family. There were so many different stops along the way. Why did you pick Navasota? Because of the small town character and charm. We're from West Columbia, which is also a small town with a lot of charm. Yeah. And Karen, you're from England, but you've lived here in the United States for quite some time. How do you take in this piece of American history that's playing out oh, here in the last few days. Oh, it's just awesome. I just can't believe it. It's just it's just so wonderful being here with everybody and, and the Texas people. <laughs> yeah, they're really, yeah. I'm, I'm, it's just awesome. I can't think no more about it. It's... The pageantry that we've seen here, mm. you're, you come from England where we have seen pageantry in a different realm mm. with royal weddings. How does it strike you now as someone who lives in America to see this is how we say goodbye to a former president? Oh, I just can't. I just can't say anything. I just, um, just, just can't. Uh, it's just amazing, really. What is the takeaway you both are trying to achieve here today when you see the train roll through? What's going to be going through your minds? We want the family to feel the love that we have. Yeah. For the respect that we have for President Bush mm -hmm. and and the love and the service that he's given our country and the example that he set is just wonderful for the youth and for all of us to follow. Yeah, yeah it's impressive the turnout, isn't it, as we look across the way here along the rail line of this uh, rail in Navasota. It's just truly impressive. And you think about this, Bill and Dominique, uh, when they were planning this day uh, and this week many years ago with President Bush, he asked at one point, is anyone going to show up? Take a look at this, what we've seen right here today, what we've seen throughout the entire week, whether it's in Houston or in Washington, D.C., or in College Station later on this afternoon. There's no doubt they have shown up, and I am certain this humble man would be very proud of how Texans are saying farewell. In Navasota, Mario Diaz, KPRC, Channel 2 News. Thank you, Mario. I just got your email. Uh, 
where somebody where you talked about somebody asking you that and they sure have showed we wondered that ourselves as a matter of fact what what, what kind of turnout that would be I think the question is has anyone well, not shown up <laughs> that's you know that's true when you think about this um, it really is an honor for us as journalists to be able to cover this um, mm -hmm. this is a lifetime moment that I know I'm gonna cherish and I know that many of my colleagues are cherishing and we were talking about this in the newsroom earlier this morning this has only happened uh, once in the last what, 50 years almost. Um, um, this is something that is a throwback to his day because President Bush, keep this in mind, I was talking to people up at the museum about this. He's from the Northeast where these rail lines are part of everyday life to this very day. That's right. You have millions of people that rely on the, rel on the rails going in and out of the Northeast corridor. So this is why he had a passion for trains because it reminded him of his childhood according to people I spoke to in the library. And today, a piece of his childhood is what he's writing yes, to his it, final home. It's, it's perfection from start to end, Mario. And, you know, you mentioned being a part of this coverage and the historical nature of it and how truly honored we all feel. And I think the audience also feels honored to be able to witness it through their TV sets if they're not here. And I just want to share a message that I got from Debbie Anderson. She says, I'm watching the live feed of KPRC from Montana. Such great coverage of a historical event. Thank you. More affirmation from a Linda Briggs who has emailed me. This sense of feeling united, one, patriotic. We need more Bushes in the world. Love this family. God bless America. That patriotic note there uh, at the end. Because, and that's, that's what these these spectacles bring us uh, this sense of togetherness that we're all one we're all americans we all share in the loss of one of our presidents we just saw mario raindrops in navasota the train is making its way toward him it will go through stoneham first um, and i'm sure for mario just like we saw with Brittany jeffers as the train passed through magnolia I could hear her voice breaking, and I could tell that for a moment you, you lose your reporter's cap, and you're just like everybody else out there, and you're feeling the impact of the story. And the nature of this moment is so huge that it's hard to not allow that to penetrate and to allow that human side to come through. We saw uh, NBC's Tom Brokaw break down, uh, break down yesterday That's and right. talking about this. Uh, we got an email from uh, June Sofka, Dominique, who w owned Otto's Barbecue, said, thank you for oh, mentioning Otto's. Yes, that's right. we were one of the president's favorite restaurants in Houston. As owners and employees, we're always happy to see him and the kindness he showed to us all. Privileged to have known and served him. That's right. Otto's was right there on Memorial, just east of Westcott. It's there no more. Um, I, I think the structure was torn down. There's something else there. It might be a Verizon store. But um, you're right. It was. <laughs> it's a well, for everywhere. It's the nature of it. But it, it was an institution. And they were known for their hamburgers, and, and the Bushes loved them. So, um, yeah. This, this from. Um, from. Um, doesn't sign it. it. Talks about their eldest son uh, deciding to enlist in the Navy during his senior year at Spring High School in 1990. His first commander in chief was President Bush. Um, he retires in two and a half years from now. They live in Magnolia, just saw the train go by. Couldn't be prouder of, of this community. The military group you saw in Magnolia was the JROTC from both Magnolia High School and Magnolia West High School. Remember, we saw them mm -hmm. in formation there when they were going through. Thank you so much for letting us know about that. Just outside of Stonehenge, uh, Daniel, what was that again? Our M Plantersville, okay. By the way, if you hear us mention the name Daniel, he's our producer, so we're asking him some questions as we present this coverage for you. Also, we talked about there being uh, four uh, living former presidents, and, and that's what we meant. The people are saying there are five, there are five presidents, not four. Uh, we're talking about former presidents who still um, uh, live and um, let's see here a lot of people emailing they're, they're watching this coverage mm -hmm. and, and enjoying it and we appreciate we appreciate any uh, comment that you have a lot of people are sharing their connection to Bush 41 as well as his connection to our community and we love hearing those stories and passing them along he was deeply entrenched in our community and the people who live here and like I said, everybody's got a Bush story. Everybody has either seen him or experienced, had an encounter with him. 
and all of them are, are full of grace and friendship and warmth. And so many people say, oh, he was right in front of me and I was afraid to say anything. And when they did, they felt like they were welcomed by an old friend. Yeah, somebody, uh, uh, I don't remember whether it was a comment in the paper that was used or something, but said they were at one of the marathons and uh, wanted to approach the president, kind of afraid to. Mm -hmm. and, and the president saw that and called him over and said, Bob, come on over here. You, yeah, nice to meet you. And he says, I was stunned to hear that he knew my name. He was wearing a name tag. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Just in case nobody knew. <laughs> so, yeah, mm. that's, th there was that huge connection that he had uh, with this town. It will never be forgotten. We were wondering out loud uh, what, what happens to the Bush family home in Tanglewood. Sure, we were talking about that yesterday. And uh, now that, you know, that there's no inhabitants. But considering how large and expansive that family is, it could uh, sort of be Grand Central Station, no pun intended here as we look at the train, for the family, and a landing pad for, uh, for Jeb or W, and whenever they come into town, there's still the family home where they can stay. And we also talked about the fact that once they get to College Station, we don't know exactly where the Bush family's gonna go, but they won't be that far to strike out to the ranch um, in Crawford still own that ranch? I'm mean, think of it now, I don't even know if he still owns it. I think he does. I think so, and I think he still does a lot of his painting from that ranch, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so they, some of them may head up to Crawford from right. there. Got a message here from Ben Vogler, and he says, I met President Bush during a fundraiser for Congressman McCall's first run for office. He was under the weather, but did not want to disappoint the guests or McCall in not showing up. Like many have said, he made you feel as if he knew you forever. It was just a wonderful moment. Uh, Stephen Manuel writes, I am a former engineer of uh, Uni uh, Union Pacific and have had the grace of operating uh, 4141 in revenue service on the Navasota subdivision, which is the route the train is on right now. Ran that route for nine years. So a lot of people uh, finding resonance in this uh, in this uh, final journey of the president to his final resting place. Claire Moriarty asks an interesting question. She says, what happens to 4141 after the funeral? To me, it should become a permanent part of his history and stay in College Station. Thank you for all that you do and the KPR staff, KPRC staff for making this a beautiful experience. Thank you, Claire. Lena Ledette says, uh, thank you for streaming Bush's funeral. By the way, this is streaming live on click2houston.com, too. In case you have to leave your set, you can pick it up on your mobile device. We're live, uh, streaming it live on Click2 Houston. Thank you for streaming Bush's funeral. Uh, Dominique and Bill are doing an excellent job. Bill more than Dominique. <laughs> I love, love their commentary. We can't be along the route, but we feel like we're witnessing this tribute to a great man. Uh, Thank you. So I'm glad we're able to bring this to you. And, and you feel uh, the same thing you'd feel as if you were, or just about the same thing as if you were standing on the route. Right. And I just, just to share also, we're watching this with you, you know, as we've been planning and preparing for our coverage of this monumental event. This is that leg where you know, we've, we've brushed up on some history and we know a little bit about this 4141 rail car, but the experience itself of watching this train go through towns, seeing the people respond, is as raw and organic of an experience for us as it is for you. Listen to this one from Pastor yeah. Jeff Jones in Forest Hill, California, watching this online. I am a pastor in Northern California, and I am in awe of all Houstonians and their love for this great president. Mm -hmm. Cannot peel myself away from your broadcast. Please accept the condolences from those in California today, our hearts are with you, Pastor Jeff Jones. That's a beautiful note. Um, Rick, ba Rick Barrett, enjoying your live coverage of the Bush train procession, brings back memories of watching the Robert F. Kennedy funeral train back in 1968 and how amazing that experience was as well. These things sure bring Americans together. In that vein, Sarah Moore just wrote in. She says, I appreciate being able to have a window to view this history. I hope we all learn from the example that George H.W. Bush exemplified. May we all be kinder and gentler and love everyone. Beautiful sentiment. Mm -hmm. Beautiful sentiment.
That's what uh, that's what he would have wanted. Um, and I think that's what he's seeing this. today. So the train is approaching Stoneham. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Stoneham or Stoneham? I'm sure somebody will let me know. <laughs> As the train passed through uh, Todd Mission, somebody there uh, said, this is the home of the Renaissance Festival and King George. That's right. If you hear little gaps in our coverage, it's because we are uh, looking for your comments and trying to include those in our coverage. I, I know Bill and I both feel it's a great way to tell the story as the train makes its route to College Station. This is the people's experience, and so hearing your comments seems fitting. James Weaver uh, writes, um, one of the highlights of my career at Continental Airlines, uh, which is you know now United, was having President uh, George H.W. Bush and First Lady Barbara on several flights. He handed out probably tens of thousands of these tie bars. He sends a picture of it, but it's a special memory I'll never forget. He sends a picture of the tie bar that uh, 41 gave him on one of the flights. They just made friends wherever they went. Uh, Jim, you're right. Big thing to them, making friends. He was. Mm -hmm. Here's a note from Kurt Ledsering. It says, a proud day to be an American, no matter your political views, watching train along the sides are black, white, Hispanic, police officers, firefighters, construction workers, and then in bold, he says, American strong. Um, again, um, more about the, the, this was the high school JROTC standing in formation uh, honoring the president as he went by um, along the route here. And Daniel, our producer, is saying that if you'd like, you can comment on our KPRC Facebook page, and we will take those comments and uh, have them as a part of our broadcast. Shannon Perry says... She's a native Houstonian of 50 years, had to be out of the country today, but watching it online, the train went right by my home and it broke my heart. Mm. She says, I couldn't be there to pay my respects to a man I met and dearly respected. Thank you for helping me feel like I'm right there with this coverage. Perfect, yeah, that's okay. how it's designed to be. So we are looking now at people gathering. I'm, I'm assuming this is Stoneham. And the train should be approaching there. And this is, this is the site that we're seeing in town after town after town, a collective gathering of people with umbrellas and some raincoats. And then as the train nears, the American flag pops up and catches the wind and starts to flutter about. And everybody puts their hands on their hearts, so they wave as the 41st president goes by. And there's that sense of anticipation. And then just a few seconds later, that sense of, I just witnessed history, and I'm so glad I'm here. Richard Long writes, the lesson I have learned from this coverage is that I thought I was nice and kind. I have now learned that I can do a better job of being both nicer and mm. kinder. There you go, the example. So thank you for, uh, for, the, for the notes you're sending in as you watch our coverage. We're very happy that it makes you feel closer to what's, what's happening. Here's a, a note from Garland Pollard. Thank you for the coverage. Watching from Episcopal uh, House in Southwest Florida near Tampa. Beautiful service. Nice to see the Texas scenery, a beautiful state. Amen, Garland. We agree. So we are now, I think, one hour away from their arrival in um, in College Station, if it holds to schedule, it's 2.25, should arrive there uh, in about an hour. The, uh, as we pointed out, the, the funeral service there is private. We will not be able to overfly it with our helicopter. We will not be able to show it to you. So essentially, <coughs> excuse me, when the, when the train arrives and the casket is offloaded uh, by, the, um, by the military, guard, uh, it will be taken into the cemetery and Bush 41 will be interred next to his wife Barbara and their daughter Robin. And uh, Bill and I are both monitoring our KPRC Facebook accounts, so if you would like to reach out to us there, uh, KPRC Dominique Soxa, KPRC Bill Baeza, 
Uh, here's a note from Merle Taylor. I was a Houston police motorcycle officer and was honored to escort President Bush 41 many times. And ironically, my dad, who was with the Air National Guard, used to strap George W. Bush 43 into his fighter jet at Ellington Force Base. What a great man we honor today. Both were aviators, military aviators. Uh, Bush 43 followed his dad into to service that way. He was a reservist and spent uh, his reserve time here at Ellington Air Force Base when it was there, as, uh, as the officer just pointed out. Kathy Templeton reaches out and says, my 85-year-old Texas-born mother and I are watching your coverage from Huntington Beach, California. Thank you so much for your complete and respectful coverage. Former League City resident and Harvey survivor. Thank you, Kathy. Okay, now we understand that they're, they're into Navasota right here. But no, no, we, I thought we passed I think Sto I think, well, we were headed to Navasota. Is this Stoneham? Okay, I, I'm sorry. We were in Magnolia before. Right, I mean, so we're so approaching Navasota. So we're coming Navasota. up to Mario. Mm -hmm. Shall we, is he available? Can we get to him live? Okay. Let, let's bring his, uh, his audio up, and then maybe he'll walk Here, they camera. want me live. Get ready. Okay, we got you, Mario. We got you. Hey, hey, guys, how you doing? This is the scene here right now up in Navasota. As you can see, this is an an elevated position now that we wanted to provide to everyone who is watching and you can see the crowd that has gathered all along the main stretch of this rail line that cuts right through the heart of town and this is truly a piece of old Texas history here as you can see across the way with the architecture that we have and people who are looking out through various windows you see the red white and blue bunting as well as the Texas flag and the flag of the United States of America. Many people here are excited uh, uh, with this form of celebration for the former president. Um, they know that it will be one of the last times that uh, obviously one of the last stops along this rail line heading into College Station, but it is a moment that they have shown up early for. Uh, when we got here uh, about 11 o'clock this morning, there was already a, a great crowd in place. Um, the crowd has grown bigger over the course of time. Little kids holding American flags as well as adults. I'm going to try to speak to this one right here. Hey, hey guys, how you doing? Good, how are you? Good. We're on Channel 2 in Houston. We're live. There's the camera right there. You're holding an American flag. Yes, I am. How special is today for you? It is very special for me because my mother, my mother works for the works for President Bush the 43rd. So this is a very important day for me. Mom, are you excited to be out here? Very excited to pay our respects however we can. Yeah, I see the White House pin that you have there, the hard pin. Um, when this train rolls through, what is the lesson you want for your children to walk away with on this day? That we live in the best country in the world. We're free to do this. We love America, and we're so thankful to play a small part in comforting the family of President Bush. You'll never forget this day. No. You'll never forget this day. You'll tell your grandchildren about this, all right? So have a great time, all right? And Thank enjoy you. this, all right? Thank you. you too. You're welcome. Um, it is a huge, huge moment here for so many individuals. As you saw that woman right there, she worked for 43 in the past. Um, children, again, of all ages coming out to say goodbye to the 41st president. And that little guy right there, again, when he's 80 years old or 94 years old, He'll be telling his grandchildren about the day that he spent here in Navasota, Bill and Dominique. Uh, before we let you go, Mario, we, you spent the last couple of days uh, reporting from College Station preparations for this train arriving. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us something about it? As the train yeah, arrives there, what, what happens? Well, what's going to be happening is it's going to pull just past um, the area of Kyle Field along Wellborn road there and what's going to happen is they've got a platform that has been built there and the train will stop and it will be unloaded once the train arrives the people who are going to be receiving him are going to be family and friends but also students from the bush school that is the school that was established at texas a and m university uh, when they built the presidential library and every single student from the school has been invited to receive the president. I was talking with a couple of students yesterday, and they've told me they've been there for a year and a half already. It's a two-year program. Uh, by far, today will be the greatest lesson, and it will be taught at a moment of silence because they will be seeing the man who bears 
the school's name in front of him, coming home to where he will be buried and they will be reminded of his service to his, this nation, his character, his integrity. And that is what they say has always been the greatest lesson that they have seen at that school. They're gonna bring him along from the train, put him into the hearse, they're gonna roll him out of that location there, and he's gonna go along George Bush Drive. It will be the same drive that the First Lady drove down back in April. They'll make a couple of zigzag turns into the presidential library, and from there it goes completely private. And it is at that moment that the Bush family will be able to say goodbye to the patriarch. Man, I knew I, I knew I asked the right guy. Let me ask you one more question, Mario. <laughs> sure, uh, go right ahead, go right ahead. Why, uh, I, I have never heard why, uh, and you may not know this either, why did 41 choose Texas A&M as a, as a spot to build his presidential library? Uh, you know, I, I just, if I'm gonna talk about the story, I hear the train, excuse me, I hear a helicopter, so the train might be coming here shortly, so we wanna focus in on capture that shot here. I'm gonna talk to you about that, uh, but I'm gonna go ahead and step away and let uh, our photographer, Ty, grab the image. Uh, the reason why he picked that location, Bill, is because Texas A&M wanted to build a presidential library, but at the same time, they also wanted to build the school. And that was a point that the president appreciated very much because of the fact that it was a school dedicated to his type of mantra in life, which was a school dedicated to policy, to service, um, and it was a way for his legacy to live on and impact young minds moving forward in society. Uh, University of Houston, Rice University, they were involved uh, in the mix. However, Texas A&M was the one that put out the school from the very get-go, and it is also the school that that keeps the spirit of Texas alive in the eyes of many. And it is th that spirit and those values that has been uh, expressed there for decades that the president appreciated. He may have graduated from Yale, but in the end, he was a member of the Texas A&M family. And they were very happy to embrace his library, his museum, as well as his school back in 1997 when they opened their doors, Bill. Don't very, make. very edifying. Thank you very much, Mario. I knew I'd ask the right guy about that, too. I think the train's headed your way. We're going to let you take it away here. It is. Okay, that's no problem. We're, we're obviously looking down towards the south here, and you're starting to see another helicopter make its way up the rail line as this train heads north. And the crowd is all looking down the tracks they realize this is the moment that they have waited for it is their time to say goodbye and honestly there's no better backdrop for me on this day than to be right here when you look at this crowd and the architecture of old texas you can hear one of the choppers flying overhead that's a security chopper you have a few others here as well that are capturing the images from high above and that is the first horn that we hear right there of that Union Pacific 4141 with members of the media, family, and the former president on board. As it rolls by, you're going to want to look for that train with the American flag right in the middle. It's got a window, plexiglass. It is lit up. We hope to capture a shot of the former president. As he rolls on through, we anticipate that the train will be slowing down here as it cuts through town. This is one of those moments where everybody says, you remember when? Do you remember where you were when? And you get to say, when? I was standing in town in Navasota, when? You'll never forget it, Dominique. Everyone who has seen this train or has seen this week play out before them in person or on television, it is memorable and it will not be forgotten. You're hearing the whistles from the Union Pacific 4141 continuing to sound in the distance. I see another chopper about half a mile away from here, which gives me the impression that it is moving in to town. It is, Mario, and in fact, the uh, train is slowing down because it is getting closer. Hear the, hear the whistle? I hear it right there. It's glad to hear. I'll let the watch. You'll see people here react in a moment when I tell them. It's slowing down from what we can see. It's slowing down. Great. Yeah, great is how one woman responds right now. 
that was a question that many were asking. How quickly would it be going by? And I told a few of them this morning that it was going to be going by very slowly. Yes, and very respectful for all the people who have taken the time to be in attendance for this historic event. I know the railroad man uh, noted that trains have to slow down as they go through towns, but it serves a double purpose. This cool, wet Texas day as we look at the rain-spattered glass of the camera from Sky 2. People bundled up with umbrellas above and flags in their hand.